Well, we are in the Advent season. This is the second week of Advent. And if you're not from a liturgical background, which many of you probably are not, uh, Advent is, is simply a time of preparing your heart and in looking forward, knowing that the Christ child, of course, is coming. And as we prepare our way in our hearts for the arrival of the Messiah, we see a, a particular truth. Uh, Almost every other religion in the world is structured so that humanity has to work its way, has to make our way to God. But in the upside down, backwards kingdom of Jesus, God comes to us. In today's passage, we're going to examine Gabriel's announcement to, to Mary, the mother of Jesus, that God is going to be among us. And in this exchange, we catch a a little glimpse uh, of the mystery and and mission and motivation that brings us Advent. So if you'd like to follow along, I'm going to read again out of Luke. We're going to be in Luke 1, Matthew, Mark, Luke. If you don't know New Testament, that's the third book of the New Testament, about uh, 70% of the way through your Bible there. And it's going to be Luke 1, 26 through 38. And I'm going to read it for you. You'll see it on the screen. There are Bibles in the chairs, and you can certainly look it up on your phone if you uh, would like to see it digitally. If you'd like to follow along, I'm going to read that. It says, it's the birth of Jesus foretold. It says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee, to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and he said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting it might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And so Mary then said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And then the angel departed from her. Now, as we hear this, as we listen to this passage, we are told about one one of the, the great mysteries of the Christian faith, the Incarnation. Now, Incarnation simply means in the flesh, right? And at this stunning moment in history, God's plan for redeeming His people is now revealed. A way in which no one could have possibly anticipated. Uh, An approach that would have been outside of anybody's thoughts. That God would become one of us. This this idea that God becoming one of us, it would have been scandalous. It, It would have been sacrilegious if it weren't true. But it is true. What a mystery. The Son of the Most High God will also be the son of some teenage girl named Mary that nobody has ever heard of before. You see, our God is not some far-off deity who demands that we, we claw and grab and work and try to make our way to Him. No, He comes near to us. He is near. He is among us. If you're reading along, look at verse 26. It says, in the sixth month, and that is 
the, the six month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. That's the story we looked a little bit at last week. And so Elizabeth is pregnant with John, who, the man who'd become John the baptizer, right? Jesus' cousin. And it says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God. And there we have one of the most fundamental facts about Christmas that there is. It's, it's the incarnation. It starts with God. The incarnation in Christmas comes from God. An angel was sent by God. You see, Christmas has no biblical meaning without God. Christmas is about the creator of the universe who is not himself part of that universe, who takes and moves himself as the person of his son into this universe that he has made. And what makes this fact even more remarkable is that this, this created universe, this universe that God created, this universe that God as God is not part of but chose to be part of and move himself into it, this very universe is in rebellion against its maker. And yet, he chose to come into it. Anyhow, he chose to come in the flesh into a universe that he made in order to save the very people who are in rebellion against him. One of the most clear statements in all of the Bible about this comes from 1 Timothy 1.15 where it says, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And folks, that is good news. So Christmas is about something that God has initiated. Something that God did in history. It has to do with the way that the created universe relates then back to this being, this God, Yahweh. This God, ha this God that has no beginning, this God that has no end, this God who has no development, just is. He's not becoming, He is. It says in Exodus 3.14, I am who I am. Christmas is about how God relates to us and then how we in return should relate back to Him. Now the mission behind all of this, the mission behind this mystery is singular. It's redemption. In this passage, we learn not just how God is going to come into the world, but we also learn why. God is on a rescue mission of redemption. And to accomplish it, He steps into our world and He plants Himself within our context. Um, Pastor Eugene Peterson passed away fairly recently. Many of you know him. He wrote the Message Bible. He puts it this way. Uh, it comes from John 1.14. And it says, The Word became flesh and blood, and it moved into our neighborhood. Right? Which is a, a neat way of thinking of Jesus. That he moved into the house next door. Right? He can relate to us. He lives on our cul-de-sac. He lives, he lives in the farm next door. The mystery of the Incarnation sheds light under the mission of Jesus. It shows us that God is always trying to come to us. And He's continuing to bring us near to Him. Now you see, this, this was God's choice. As we heard, an angel was sent from God to a virgin. God's way of breaking into the universe was that he would be conceived into the womb of a virgin. What an amazing story. For those who don't believe, that's hard to believe, in fact. Why did God do it this way? I don't know. He's God. We have to be a little careful when we speculate beyond that. The Bible doesn't tell us. But this is how God has chosen to come into our lives, to come into our world. And the best answer that we get to that is, is verse 35. It says, And an angel of the Lord answered her, The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be born, and he will be called Holy, the Son of God. God chose 
to be conceived in the womb of a virgin so that the fatherhood of this child would be absolutely unique. He is the Son of God, not the Son of Joseph biologically. He has a a divine father, not a biological human father. And therefore, because of that, he is divine. He is God's son. But he had an earthly mother. Biologically, Mary is his mother. He is Mary's son. God chose to break into the universe by entering in through this young teenage girl. Now, if you don't know your history, this was prophesied about 700 years before it ever happened. 700 years before Christ was born, it was talked about by the prophet Isaiah. He talks about uh, the the coming of Jesus and about Jesus' birth. In Isaiah 7.14, it says, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. This prophecy was fulfilled at Christ's birth. A son born through divine conception in a virgin without a human father. And he was to be called Emmanuel, which as I mentioned means simply God with us. This son born of a human virgin was the very God of the universe, the creator If you continue on reading in Isaiah, a couple of chapters later, Isaiah prophesied again about the birth of Jesus in Isaiah 9-6. And you've heard this one before, Charlie Brown, right? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. You see, both the Old Testament as well as the New Testament speak to these truths. God is on a mission to rescue His people. You see, God has a plan. And that plan has been in place far longer than you or I could ever know. But why? Right? Why would God do this for us? We, we are an open and active rebellion against Him. Why? Why would God want to do this for us? Well, as we read through the story, the motivation behind the mission is clear. It's love. Advent is a proclamation of God's unthinkable love for His people, for us, for you, and for me. It's a, it's a love that, that is more than sentimental. It's a love that's more than just simply intention. It's an active, it's an overflowing, it's an abounding, abundant, even perhaps reckless kind of love. God risks it all because He is driven by love. Love for us. And it's still true today as it was at the time of Mary, that nothing is impossible with God. That's as true today as it was 2,000 years ago. Now yes, it's also true that somebody has to say yes, or else the impossible cannot happen. And that ought to encourage us in this season, at this time of year, to share the Christmas story to share this story. The Christmas story, if you don't know, is filled from beginning to end with miracles. The wise men, right? The wise men, they see this miraculous star in the sky and they travel to Bethlehem. The angels, the angels come and they sing to the shepherds. That's a big deal because the shepherds were nobodies. They were a bunch of stinky, unwashed young men living out in the woods. An old woman, far beyond childbearing years. She gives birth to a son. And then the big one, right? A virgin gets pregnant. Or how about the the wicked king who comes to town and kills all of the babies, except for one gets away. 
his parents were warned in a dream. Warned in a dream of the king's evil plan. So Joseph and Mary escape in the nick of time. There are miracles galore in the Christmas story. There are two words that always go together. Christmas and miracles. And that's good news for all of us, for you and for me. Maybe today you're, you're, maybe you're feeling, you've been carrying a heavy burden, right? Maybe for you the season is tough because you're lonely. Maybe you struggle at Christmas because there's all these expectations, but the finances just aren't there. Maybe you're out of work or underemployed, don't have a good lead for a, a fruitful job for your future. Maybe you're just struggling in a relationship, struggling in, in a marriage. Maybe you're almost out of hope. Maybe you've been estranged from a, a family member. Maybe you have a child who's running and trying to get far, far away from God. The list goes on and on. But of, in all those things and all that, what they have in common is the solutions in the moment seem impossible. They seem impossible by any human standard, by any human means. We can't fix this problem. And for the most part, if it's up to us, they are impossible. Because after all, if it was a fixable problem, we would have already fixed it, right? We would have solved it long ago. But remember this. Christmas is about miracles. They happened 2,000 years ago, and they can still happen today. As the old gospel song puts it, you got any rivers that you think are uncrossable? You got any mountains that you can't tunnel through? God specializes in doing the impossible. He does the things that others cannot do. So, what is it then that God wants from us? Does God want... Want us to have total comprehension about the future, future before we could even trust Him, right? That we know it all? No, that's impossible. And besides, it's frankly, honestly, probably better that we don't know what the future holds for us because we would actively do things to screw it up if we knew. Does God want us to have a perfect knowledge of the Bible? No. I mean, that'd be awesome if you did, but, but if you did it still wouldn't change your heart necessarily. Knowledge is not necessarily transformative. Do we have to be, you know, that, that, that super spiritual, like on the verge of becoming a saint kind of person? Well, thankfully no, because most of us aren't close to being saints, right? We are all sinners. Very few of us would meet the qualification of being a saint, so to speak. But notice how Mary responds in verse 38. I love this. In Luke 1, 38, Mary says, after hearing, Hey Mary, I know you're a teenage and all, and you're not yet married, and, well, you're still a virgin, but you're having a kid. Merry Christmas. Right? What's Mary's response to that? Mary says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. See, Mary didn't understand. She didn't have the bigger picture. She didn't have all the knowledge. She didn't understand anything probably, but she trusted God. That's it. Nothing complicated at all. Just simple faith in God. God is God. I am not. He knows what he's doing, so I'm going to trust him. I don't understand everything he's telling me, but that's not going to stop me from believing. And if you were to trace Mary's life through the rest of the gospel narratives, you'd find she never loses the simple faith in God. 
Folks, we worship the same God that Mary worshipped. His word to us is just as reliable as His word to her. Though our circumstances might differ, we would be well served to follow in Mary's example and trust in God. I am the Lord's servant. May your word, Lord, to me be fulfilled. If you were here last week, remember last week about Zechariah? That same angel of the Lord came to him. What happened? He doubted. Right? He doubted and he wasn't able to speak for a long time. And I think Luke includes these two stories right next to one another so that we can see the contrast and response from Zechariah and Mary. It was the same angel. It was the same sort of news. Surprise! Pregnancy! And by pairing Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph so closely, I think Luke is trying to point us towards Understanding the importance of simple faith. Mary demonstrates the power of pure faith. When you look at her accomplishments, it honestly doesn't seem like she really did a lot, right? But she was obedient. And her obedience changed the course of history. Sometimes the very most profound thing that we can do with our lives is to wholeheartedly say, Lord, I am your servant. So what does God want from us? He wants the very same thing that he wanted from Mary. Simple faith that he will keep his word in unlikely and unexpected ways. And then for us to to take and share His love with those around us. This week, find ways to do that. Trust God and love others. That is your homework for this week. You do get homework when you come to church occasionally. When you leave these doors, leave. Trust God and love others. Sometimes we try to overthink things. We try to make things more complicated or more difficult than they have to be. Christmas is a great time for us to be reminded just to slow down. Block out the distractions. Focus in on the reason for the season. I don't know what you are hoping for this Christmas, but I I sure hope it's for something. I sure hope that you are hoping for something that is something more than just some junk you could find under a tree. Jesus came in the flesh for us so that we could have so much more than some shiny new stuff. Try to find ways this week to love others. Share the love of Christ in a new way or in a new place. Take steps of faith this week. Call someone who you need to talk to. Invite someone who needs to hear the message. Serve someone who can't give you something in return. Show grace where it isn't merited. Show grace where the world would say, It isn't necessary. Practice a simple faith. A simple faith that believes that the God who came and walked among us still walks among us today. Believe that that God who walked among us 2,000 years ago and today is still up to miraculous things. If you love Him, And if you love others, I promise God will do great things. So do it this week and change the world. Amen? Let's pray.